Can everybody see and hear me? Everything working? I was, uh, I was streaming on a completely different channel for the first few minutes here, so I was very confused why nobody was responding in chat. So I've just been talking happily away uh, on a completely different channel, I apologize. Hi everybody, welcome to 2018. I'm super excited to be here with you guys. I'm gonna do a bunch of streams this year across all of our different services. Some of them will be more coding focused, some of them will be more tutorial focused. Today's example, we're gonna go into SageMaker and SageMaker is a little bit, uh, it is my favorite service by far that we launched at reInvent and that's among 70 different announcements that we had and I loved all of them. Uh, SageMaker just, it does the same thing for me that Glue did when we launched it with ETL jobs. It's a, it's a, it's a service for developers by developers. It gets me excited, you know, like I, I can play around with things, I can tinker and, and there are all kinds of different new facets of it that I'm discovering every day. So what I want to do today is kind of walk through a couple of the example notebooks in SageMaker. Then if time permits, we're going to try and roll our own example. Uh, I don't know how well this is work. I haven't tried it before, so you'll be coding along with me. Uh, I have the chat up, so feel free to ask any questions in the chat. I can talk about whatever you want. Uh, but without further ado, let's get started. Uh, so this is called one and a half factors of authentication. And you can see up in my little shortcuts bar here, I have Amazon SageMaker. Uh, something that I was doing earlier uh, I was actually just playing around with putting different icons up here. The cool thing about this little toolbar, for those of you who have never used it before, it actually persists across accounts because the, the toolbar configuration is stored in a cookie uh, for the AWS console. So even if you're logging into different accounts in different regions, you can get that toolbar persisted. So if you see if I go over to US East 1, it's still there. Uh, but today we're going to be playing around in US West 2. Let me make sure I've got all of my stuff in the right place. Close down that Jeff Barbot. Yeah, everything's set up the way it needs to be. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start a Sage. Let me, let me take a moment to kind of walk through what SageMaker is. SageMaker is an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline. That means that you can open up a Jupyter Notebook with a full Conda environment, uh, with PySpark, with um, uh, all, all manner of different tools available to you. And then you can tinker, you can play with data, you have this auto-expanding file system, uh, it can all be encrypted, so if you're dealing with kind of, you know, important data, you don't have to worry uh, too much about missing anything and, or, or exposing anything. And then you can start jobs, and these training jobs, you can say, I want you to train across n number of instances of this type, and produce a model and that model is kind of an artifact uh, and there are different frameworks like Keras uh, or, or sorry different frameworks like TensorFlow or MXNet will have different kind of model artifacts but what you can do is you can take these model, out of mo model artifacts put them into S3 and then you can create an endpoint and the endpoint is the really cool part and we'll talk about that probably not today uh, I mean, we, we might get into it a little bit today, but we'll, we'll cover the endpoints in detail and talk about rolling your own custom endpoints uh, in an episode next week where we're going to build a, a Twitter bot that's powered by AI. So the first thing that you typically do when you're working on a machine learning task is you kind of think about what data do you have available? You know, what business question are we trying to, to solve? So let's say I have... Uh, this data set of time series information with some value correlated, whether it's sales, whether it's um, the cost of purchasing something, and it depend it's seasonal or it has uh, a pretty rapid change across the course of the day, uh, predicting stock prices, any, any of these things, you kind of start with the question that you're trying to answer. Then you look at what data do I have to solve this question? So once you have those two questions answered, you can kind of start to play around with things in, in this Jupyter Notebook instance. So what I'll do, I'll create this Jupyter Notebook instance. And again, feel free to ask any questions in chat. I'm happy to completely de derail my entire planned uh, presentation here. Uh, we can talk about something completely different. 
Uh, so what are we, what should we call this notebook? It's a good question. How about Kappa? We'll use an existing role. Um, Zuma lives. Zuma lives. I can't tell if that's a SpaceX joke or not. I think spaces are not allowed, so we'll just say Zuma lives. Okay. And I already have a P2X large instance running, so we'll have to put this on a smaller one. Um, and rather than making you guys wait around for this to provision, what I've done is I've already opened up uh, an existing notebook. So I'm just gonna open this. It'll take us to our Jupyter notebook. And like I said, it's a full Conda environment, so you can, well, that's, that's not a good message. Uh, you can see I've got a couple of different environments that I can instantiate. I've got MXNet, I've got Anaconda, I've got Python 3, TensorFlow, all kinds of good stuff. And I can create a couple of new notebook types. So when it goes to a notebook type, I can go, I want, you know, uh, something for R, I want something for PySpark, I want a Conda environment that has MXNet pre-imported and all set up, uh, or TensorFlow, or just plain Python. So all of this is, is kind of fun and working. One of the things that I did to kind of get started here was I actually downloaded uh, some existing examples. So if you go here to this URL, and I'll paste this in the chat, you can see there are a whole bunch of examples. And what you get by default on the, um, uh, on the Jupyter Notebook instance is actually a couple of, so if you go to the sample notebooks, what you see here in this introduction to Amazon algorithms and stuff is actually a couple days behind what's in the Git repo. So one of the things that we're gonna to use today is the deep AR model. Um, and this is a synthetic data set that we'll be creating. And we'll, we'll just start with this one and we'll work on some other ones afterwards. Uh, but we're gonna be using this data set. So I just cloned that uh, into one of these folders, this Amazon SageMaker folder. And then if you go to introduction to Amazon algorithms and then go to the deep AR synthetic, uh, you can see that notebook. Um, and I don't think this is in the, the regular one. I'll check one more time. Whoops, it's kind of taking a second to load there. Yeah, so this one's a little bit behind. Um, so here's, here's our data set and uh, you know, there's just some preamble which says import time. In, well, first of all, let's look at the deep AR algorithm. So we posted a blog post the other day about the deep AR algorithm, which is something that we put into SageMaker on the 16th, on the 8th of January. And then on the, uh, on the 18th of January, we added yet another algorithm. So there's a lot of really fast, cool stuff happening with SageMaker. People are adding new algorithms all the time. Um, and it's basically for time series prediction. And it uses this kind of moving average as part of the fundamental kind, I, I think it's called an ARIMA, like an autoregressive integrated moving average. I, I don't actually know that it's called that. I, I may have made that up. Um, where it, it basically says, let me, figure out whatever window I need in order to predict what the next thing is gonna be. So if you if you look at one of these plots that's not in here, uh, well, I'll, I'll make a plot in a little bit then. Um, and then we're gonna do, just here, we're gonna say map plot lib inline. So this should make everything run inline and then we can install this S3FS environment, which makes it a little bit easier to work with S3. Uh, and then we'll import S3, oops, import Boto3, import SageMaker, get the execution role. And then I've already made this bucket, um, AWS, let me make this a little bit bigger. So I've already made this kind of uh, AWS S3 bucket. So if I go AWS S3 make bucket S3, uh, Rand Hunt, Twitch demos, and then we say 
that the uh, region is US West 2. That'll work. Um, and it's really important to use the right region. Um, one of the one of the problems that I ran into a couple times when I was just learning to play around with SageMaker was I would be using the CLI on one side and it would be locked to US East 1 or something. So I'd be creating some of my resources uh, in US East 1 and then I'd be trying to pull from them in US West 2. And you don't really realize that you're doing that because many of these resources work fine globally. And it's only occasionally where you find something where it needs to be in the same region. Uh, and some of the training stuff does need to be in the same region. So keep that in mind if you, if you're, before you start your training job, uh, make sure that everything's like in the right region, everything can access everything else. Um, and we'll just call this demo deep AR. And these list of containers uh, are just on the Elastic Container Registry and there are a couple different accounts per region. And this is just the forecasting deep AR container. You can download this container yourself. Um, you're not, you, you can look and see what exactly it's doing. Uh, this will show how bad I am at Docker. Um, I don't even remember the commands to download one of these containers, but you can get these containers. We don't actually have to do that. We're just going to be using this US West 2 one. And okay, so this is a kind of uh, toy example. This is not a, a real world example. We'll move on to the real world example after we get this one working. I just want to use this as an example to showcase, you know, creating a job, building different components of, of uh, a model. So we're going to have an hourly kind of time series that we are predicting the next 48 hours of. So we're going to set a context length of 72, and I believe that just means the, the, the 72 hours. We also need to configure the so-called context length, which determines how much context of the time series the model should take into account. So it's going to use the previous 72 hours to, to predict the next 48. Uh, so, and then for this notebook, we'll generate 200 noisy time series, each consisting of 400 data points with a seasonality of 24 hours. In our dummy example, all the time series start at the same point at T0. When preparing your data, it's important to correct the start point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this whole correcting the start, start point thing, uh, I think this matters for deep AR, but for many other algorithms, like so long as you're not bucketing it uh, at a specific time, it's you can kind of do unsupervised stuff there. So we'll start all this, we'll generate the data, <coughs> Excuse me. This is what the data looks like. So you can see it's just this idea of um, uh, a time and then a value. Uh, you can see that the format that it's expecting uh, to submit to the algorithm is something like start and then a category. And that category is only useful for like identifying different features and then a target value. So this will just be whatever the variables at that time are. Uh, here we go. And we can plot this. And then we'll generate some training data. And the way we'll generate, well, we won't generate any training data. Uh, we'll basically take this synthetic data set that we've predicted and we'll split it so that we have uh, the, the last little bit will be the, oh, and I'm only showing you one here. So we could just do four oops, for uh, series and time series. Um, oops, series dot plot, plot plot show. So you can see we've got a bunch of different um, time series data sets here. It's not just one that we're building. Oh man, how many of these did we build? This might run for a while. <laughs> Oops. How big is this? Oh well. 
might have to restart the kernel if this doesn't finish sometime soon. Anyway, the next thing that we do is we kind of split the data set, right? So we say, I want to take the last 24 hours of data, or the last few hours of data, and I want to make that my, my test data set. So uh, you're going to keep that out and make sure that the model is, is kind of conforming to that. Um, still going. So the, yeah, there are 200 different plots. Strange. Okay. And this should show just, we're just looking at the first plot here, but it we're basically just cutting off the end of each one of these training sets. Uh, and then we are creating a couple of different, uh, JSON strings that will work. And you can see this is this format that we're creating, the object equals start string TS index target list TS, um, is exactly what we need to be able to feed into that deep AR algorithm. So the next thing that we do is we want to take those two different data sets, um, for this, these two methods that we've defined here, and we want to put a training.json and a test.json into S3, uh, which doesn't take long at all. And this is the fun part. So uh, I realize I've just covered like a lot of stuff, but we're going to go write a model from scratch in a little bit. So I, I just wanted to walk through this one. Oh, and somebody's asking who the speaker is. So I'll put on my handy dandy um, developer relations nonsense here. Um, so this is me. My name is Randall. I'm a software engineer at uh, AWS. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter for some serverless hot takes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start training this. So I just want to point out some of the cool things here. So we're using a built-in algorithm from SageMaker. Uh, where did we first define SageMaker here? So if we go up, uh, if we go up, we're importing SageMaker here and from that, we are able to pull in a container. Um, where are we passing this? This image name here, which is really just this container up here, this US West 2.1, forecasting deep AR. And we're going to say we want to train this on one instance. Uh, the instance type is going to be a C4X uh, X large. The job name is going to be demo deep AR or we'll call this Twitch deep AR, or we can call it something else. What do you guys want to call it? Uh, so Dat Blind Archer asks, is there a way to test an AWS system with an EC2 on a local computer, for example, making a demo of automatically winding closing instances? Um, I'm not sure what you mean exactly, but yeah, that SageMaker SDK, the one that I'm showing right now is, is on, I mean, it's just a Python library. So you can pip install SageMaker essentially, and you're able to go in and, and run a lot of stuff locally. Uh, you can also get all of those Docker containers and run them locally. Uh, it's not like they're, they're hidden or anything. And then there's a public training interface that you can kind of conform to, uh, to see how it all shakes down. Like I, this, this whole, running uh, stuff locally is something that I suggest everybody does. The reason that I've provisioned this Jupyter Notebook instance is the data set that I intend on dealing with afterwards is quite a bit larger than something that I want to download locally. Uh, so I could run this on my MacBook Air and still be able to talk to this Jupyter Notebook. And the other advantage is somebody else that uh, shares my AWS account would be able to open it up and, and use it quite easily without me having to ship the notebook around. Um, so I'm going to run this, uh, I'm going to declare some hyperparameters here. Uh, we have a frequency of an hour. We have a context length of 72, a prediction length of 24. The number of cells is, uh, like the number of cells per layer. We have a likelihood, uh, function of Gaussian. Uh, we're going to train for 20 epochs. We're going to have a batch size of 32 with a learning rate of 0 0.001, a dropout rate of 0.05 and an early stopping patience of 10. Those are the hyperparameters that we're passing in this. And then we just define 
the, the data channels that we're going to use to pass in our training data and our test data. And boom, it will start training. Um, so this will take a while. So let's hop back over to the console. And if we go into this console, we can see there are some jobs. So we just started this job, which is the Twitch deep AR one. And you can see a couple of details here. Um, we're coming from US West and we've got this IAM role. We're training on this instance type. We have one instance. Uh, we have a certain size for the volume. This is where our data is. This is where our test data is. We aren't using any encryption. These are the hyperparameters we packed, we put in. We can see the logs in CloudWatch from this building. I don't think there will be any quite yet, but it will generate some in a minute. You have to wait for the instance to come up. Uh, and this will run. I've got one that I ran earlier. This is one where I had the bucket wrong. Uh, yeah, see. So you'd get pretty good error messages that help you figure out what's going on. Uh, but this is one where I had the bucket in the right place. And you can see it completed. We can look at the logs. Da, 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 da. You can see, you know, it's training, it's getting better. We did 20 epochs, all that good stuff. Uh, but I don't even have to use the Jupyter Notebook in order to create this job. Uh, and Picknicker Gina asked, did I have to set up CloudWatch in this instance or does it automatically do that for you? It will do that for you automatically. Um, oh, and Tech Newbie is asking me to zoom in my screen a bit. Let me make it a little bit bigger. How's that? Wow, this is really big for me. I'm gonna make it one smaller. There we go. Um, and then from that job, you can actually go and create a model. Uh, and that model is gonna use that same forecasting deep AR container, but you're just gonna to point to wherever that model artifact was created. So if we go and we look back at these jobs, you can see um, this one that we did earlier, it had a model artifact output. Uh, and I'll just download this and show you what it looks like. It's, it's really just um, here. It's really just very simple stuff. Da, 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 da. It's, it's basically what you'd see in any other model where you have parameter files, you have the different layers. Uh, and if you have existing models, you can just point uh, your, your model creation thing. Where was I? You can just point your model creation over here and create model at your existing model. Uh, and you can use an existing container as well. Uh, and there's a whole interface to, to conform to for that, which I'll, I'll talk about maybe today, maybe tomorrow, uh, or sorry, maybe today, maybe next week. Uh, it depends how far along we get today. So let's go see how this job is doing. It's still in progress. That's okay. Uh, what we'll do is we will hop over to, here we go. We'll hop over to the one that I had already trained. Uh, oh, but I no longer have access to that. So let me just, um, let me just do it like this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create an endpoint to predict the output from this model. Rather than using the model that's still training, because I don't want to waste a ton of time here, I'm actually going to create a, a new endpoint equals SageMaker session dot endpoint from job. And we'll say job name equals demo. And we got to go look, see what it was really fast. The one that completed demo DPR. Figuring out which tab I'm on is always fun. 
And we'll do initial instance count equals one, instance type equals ml.m4 x large, come on, large. And the deployment image equals image name that we set earlier, which is again, just that same forecasting Docker container and then roll equals roll. Um, oh, this is still running. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can just sort of stop this. Um, or alternatively, we can take this whole shindig and we can create it in the console rather than waiting for this to finish. So I can take this container, I can go over and I can go create model from this and we'll call this Twitch model. Uh, and I'll use this, that'll all be good. I don't need a particular host name. So I'll create the model here. Can't find a demo DPR output. Did I call it something else? Rand Hunt Twitch demo DPR. I might have, yeah, I'm in the wrong bucket, I think. Or maybe I deleted that bucket. Rain Hunt Twinch, SageMaker, DPR, output. This is in US West. So, must point to a single gzip. Pretty sure I'm in the right place there. Am I in the wrong? Well, yeah, the Rain Hunt Twitch demo bucket that I made is um, is the one that's training currently. And that'll take another five or six minutes to finish. So I was trying to leap ahead here using one that I had made earlier. But I think maybe I called it something else. I might've called it Rain Hunt demos or something. Let's try again. Saying can't find model data at. Um, I mean, maybe I need to put in tar.gz. I don't think that I need to. Maybe I need to give SageMaker access to it. Hmm, what did I do here? We're in US West 2. Are we in US West 2 over here? We are. Got the output. I think this is it. I'm not passing in the full path. So this, this should get it working. Here we go. Yeah. That should do it. Okay. Um, Can't find model data there either. Why? I'll put demo. I'll put. But this is where it is. Okay, let's um. Let's read some questions for a second while we wait for the other model to finish. Um, uh, starting out with uh. Picker Gina, which asks, did you have to set up CloudWatch in this instance or does it do it automatically for you? It does it automatically. Um, you do have to, in the SageMaker role that you create, provide access to, to CloudWatch. Um, next question is, can someone be both a solutions architect and a technical evangelist or is technical evangelist an entirely separate job in and of itself? I would say technical evangelist is a separate job, but I would say if you are a solutions architect, uh, going to a technical evangelist role is pretty common just because you you have to be technically savvy 
Um, you have to have some experience working with customers before you can really talk authoritatively about any kind of technology. Uh, and then we're pleb in Twitch. <laughs> what is SageMaker? SageMaker is an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline. And what I mean by that is you can tinker with data in a Jupyter notebook. You can create jobs that will actually run and, and train your models for your machine learning. And then you can create endpoints that will host those models and serve predictions. Um, do I need to add tar.gz again? And then I, do I want to go one level deeper? No. Um, and then crumbling crud asks, does SageMaker use neural networks or can it be configured to? Yeah, so there are a bunch of different algorithms that SageMaker supports. Um, they're adding new ones all the time. Um, here's a list of the built-in algorithms. Um, where's the, there should just be a list of algorithms somewhere. So like you have linear learner, factorization machine, sequence to sequence, word to vec, blazing text is the word to vec one. Uh, deep AR forecasting is the one we're doing today. Neural topic modeling, latent something allocation. I don't know what half of these mean. Like the k-means, I think everybody has used that before. The image classification algorithm. Uh, you can also make custom models, which is something that I'll talk about uh, next week. And that's, that's the fun part. But the really cool thing is you don't even have to make these custom models. Uh, for stuff to, to, to immediately start seeing some benefit. Uh, where are we here? This is still training. Let's see how far along are we? Oh, the job is complete. So So now this is running. which is creating that deep AR job using the output from that. Um, although we don't even need to do that anymore. We could go back here using the one that we created earlier because this is done now. So this is still provisioning. So if we go back to the SageMaker console and we look at jobs, uh, we can see the Twitch one completed, this one completed both took eight minutes and if we go to models you can see that we're creating this one uh, and this is just from the code that i ran over here this this code where i hard coded the name of it um, and it was able to get the output directory and all of that from it uh, and it was able to get the role and everything from it and Blank space series says, how do you select the right algorithm given uh, trial algorithm status that I have? Uh, so there is some guidance actually in the documentation about how to choose an algorithm. And we're going to be looking at another data set today for, uh, that Sunil Maya created. Um, we, did a, we did a machine learning basics course last year. But you kind of start with a question. And the question is, you know, what business problem am I trying to solve? And there, there are two kind of main categories for this sort of data. One is, you know, unsupervised learning where you just sort of throw data at it and it tries to figure out features. And then there are uh, kind of supervised learning where you just you say what you want the output to look like and you kind of have to modify the input to, to look a certain way. So you, you, you can run through this, this algos tutorial here and it will help you answer different questions uh, about how to choose an algorithm. Um, like for instance, this LDA is, this algorithm is suitable for determining topics in a set of documents. It is an unsupervised algorithm, which means that it doesn't use example data with answers during training. Uh, the unsupervised stuff is really, really useful in terms of, uh, I just have a ton of data and I want you to, to, to find stuff out about it, but you don't necessarily have a ton of labeled data. Um, yeah, all kinds of good stuff. Let's see how this is doing now. It's still provisioning, I think. So we can go back to the SageMaker endpoints. This is still provisioning. Ba -ba -ba. 
So the way that this works really is once you have your model and the way the model works is you can see it's pointing at these artifacts here. I don't know why it wasn't working when I tried to create it. Um, uh, when I tried to create it with uh, just using the console, I think it might be a, an IM role issue, uh, but it's working fine now. Um, pardon me. And then we go and we create an endpoint configuration from that. And the endpoint configuration just says, uh, I want you to send all traffic to this particular instance type. And then you provision the actual endpoint. And the actual endpoint that you provision uh, gives you a URL like this that you can invoke. And then you can invoke it um, pretty easily. You can say, you know, import photo 3, photo 3. Yeah sage maker equals photo three dot client sage maker I think it's runtime dot sage maker um, and then you just say sage maker dot invoke endpoint and then you give the endpoint name which is in this case la di da and then I think you have to pass in a payload um, so in my infinite wisdom of not remembering how any of these endpoints work, we'll just say help sagemaker.invoke endpoint, and we'll see what it expects. It expects an endpoint name, it expects a body, some content type, and an accept header. Cool. Um, I'm really hoping this just finishes provisioning so that we can move on. Uh, I wonder if I kill this, if it'll stop provisioning the endpoint. I don't think it would. Hmm. It's got to be finished soon. Let's read some questions while we're waiting. Um, how do you select the right algorithm? Um, is there a price recurring fee associated with SageMaker? Is it free to use? Uh, you pay for only what you use. So there's not like a, a monthly price or anything. You, so let's say you, you spin up a notebook and it's, you know, the big beefy instance. It, uh, it only runs for, for however long you're working on it. And you can even set uh, some monitoring and some Lambda functions that will automatically shut it down if it's not doing anything, all kinds of good stuff like that. So if we go back to SageMaker, you can see in the notebook instances, I can actually see some uh, monitoring here. Um, actually, I can't, can I? Um, there are CloudWatch metrics for these notebook instances. I remember that. But I guess you can't go straight to them. So we go into CloudWatch. And we go to metrics, and then we look for uh, slash AWS slash SageMaker. Um, we should get a couple of different metrics here. Uh, and the notebook instance isn't included. Hmm. Man, this is still going. So we're still waiting. In the meantime, why don't we go ahead and start working on a different, uh, different notebook. So we have this time series thing that we did in our uh, podcast, not in our podcast, in our Twitch stream last year. And you know this said this has my name on it, but really Sunil did all of the work. I am still a, a machine learning newbie, and uh, he has a whole kind of set of really really good examples in his GitHub. Here we go. This this URL, if you want a bunch of different cool examples, 
um, is really, really good to kind of learn about how to use the MXNet in particular, but also a couple of other things. Uh, but what I wanted to do is take my Twitter data. So if you go to analytics.twitter.com, you can see kind of what happens in your tweets um, and, and where it all goes. Um, and then you can download like the last 38 days or the last 20 days or you know however long you want. I think there's like a limit to how far you're, yeah. So you can only do 90 days at a time. But what I did is I went and I, here we go. I went and I downloaded all of this and I kind of joined them all together and I have this notebook running. I have it running somewhere. Um, perhaps in a completely different tab. No idea which tab it is in. Huh. Uh, but basically what I did is I just imported all of those different CSV files into, um, into pandas. And then I kind of stripped everything except for impressions and uh, the time of the tweet out. And then I was trying to figure out if I could kind of normalize those, those tweets and, and predict how many impressions I would get at a specific, at a specific time. Uh, so let's go back to SageMaker and see if this endpoint's done provisioning yet before we really move on here. So, okay, cool. It says it's in service. So this is done. This is provisioned. If we go back over here, you can see that this is done. Um, now keep in mind the code that we ran is the one that's commented out now because I edited it after we ran it. So then we're going to build uh, something that subclasses this real-time predictor. So this is provided by the SageMaker SDK. And all we really need to do is define this kind of predict endpoint. Um, and we have this encode request and decode response. And really all this is, is how do you, how do you figure out, you know, what kind of body input am I taking? Because if you look at these containers, if you want to imagine what they're sending in is it's just a post body. So it's a curl, you know, it's a, it's a post request and you can put whatever you want in the body up to like five megs or something like that. And what you get back is also undefined. So it can be any kind of binary encoded data. It doesn't need to be, uh, you know, it could be JSON. It could be just plain text. You know, you can send back and receive whatever you want. So in this case, we're just going to subclass this real-time predictor. We're going to do uh, set all of these um, variables up here. Uh, the prediction length is, is just going to be, um, you know, the frequency will be one hour and then the uh, prediction length will be 24 hours because uh, we're just going to inherit those from earlier on. And then we'll define this kind of uh, predict method, which we'll call out to the predict uh, superclass method and then the encoding and decoding. And then we'll run it and we can take our previous data and we can see what it looks like. And you can see this is what the, the prediction is. So looks pretty good. This is our real data. This is the stuff we sent in. And this is where the prediction median is. So kind of going along here, it's pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. And we had a bunch of different plots, so uh, not bad, not bad. Uh, so there was a question from Dying Fajita. Hey, I think, oh, uh, yeah, that is me. I, I used to work for, um, used to work for this company. Fun place to be. Um, okay, cool. So that is the deep AR algorithm. We also just launched this um, uh, word blaze one uh, or some AWS SageMaker back to blaze. Please. I can't remember what it's called. Um, blog. Oops. Damn. 
keep hitting the wrong thing. So we launched Blazing Text, which is a uh, parallel word to back and um, this is really, really cool. And it, you know, they just keep launching all of these new algorithms. And if we continue at the same pace, by the end of the year, we'll have more than a hundred, which is way cool to think about. Um, I'd suggest following this blog. It's really useful. Um, and okay, cool. So let's look at this time series modeling one. Now, if we go back over here, you can see this endpoint is still provisioned. Um, I'm probably going to like deprovision all of this now. I'll, I'll leave it up for the series uh, for now. And you know we could we could front this with the lambda function, right? Like we could hop over to lambda and we could say um, create new function, create function uh, Python predict things. And then we can go down and we can just say um, import Boto3 event data JSON, or I'm sorry, import JSON data equals JSON.load. And then you know we have a little client here, which is SageMaker equals Boto three dot client runtime no, runtime dot SageMaker, and then we say SageMaker dot invoke data, and then we just have our little endpoint, um, and we can even do this with an API gateway proxy. We don't even just have to use a, a lambda function, and that'll go and, and invoke um, our our thing like we were trying to do earlier. So it takes you know. Let's see, it takes, takes an endpoint name, which you would typically want to inherit from um, a variable. So you can say os.getenv endpoint name equals os.getenv endpoint name. And then we can define those environment variables here. Endpoint name is going to be this one. And so then we say endpoint name equals endpoint name. Um, let's see. The body is going to be that data. The content type is going to be um, application slash JSON. And the accept is going to be application slash JSON. And then we can do Result equals return result, um, and that's all you have to do. That is, you know, you, you don't even have to have this being fronted by a an API gateway. You can front this with whatever you wanted. So let's say you have, I'll save all this. Let's say you have um, an existing kind of uh, glue job, like a an ETL job for pulling stuff in. You can just call out to PySpark and say, hey, I want you to run on this. Uh, on this, on um, you know, new tweak data coming in, it's cool. It's it kind of all comes together once you start playing with it. And I will I will talk at length about making it all come together uh, next week. But for now, let's move on to this time series modeling one. Okay, so we did this once before, and Sunil led this and did this, and he spoke at length about how recombinant neural networks work, um, and what an H activation function was, and and how all of this came together. Uh, I still struggle to understand it all. But something that has helped me is three blue, one brown um, YouTube channel is spectacular in terms of not just the math behind all of this, but also there's a machine learning class that they created. Um, I think this person's name is uh, Grant Sanderson or something like that. Um, and they have a whole machine learning class Oh, our whole neural networks class. Uh, and this playlist is just absolutely amazing. Some of the really cool stuff that they do is they talk about how the, the networks come together and you know how you, you build convolutions versus how you build uh, a simple network. All, all good stuff. Check it out. 
uh, good way to spend your time. Um, but we're not going to be doing too much with that today. Um, we're really just going to be running this notebook. And uh, you can see I've already kind of downloaded the data. So we can go look at this really fast. I think this is a huge file. But you can see um, this is the cost for a P2X large instance running Linux in US East 1B. I don't think we have any other availability zones here. We don't. Uh, so this is just plain regular time series data. Um, and you can see this is what it looks like. We have our date, we have the cost, and then we can parse that. Uh, we can see what the, the cost is. And just for some comparison, um, we can go see what it is in US West 2. I'm pretty sure this was US East 1 that we compared, so maybe I'll hop over there. We can go to the spot market. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is that we actually changed the way the spot pricing works. So you see these big spikes um, in, in some of these locations. One of the things that, well, I mean, this is over a pretty long time actually. So one of the things that we did was we made it, we made the changes in the spot um, market a little bit more uh, less spiky. We made them less spiky. And that has really made a lot of people happy. Uh, and we have this whole, you know, spot advisor, which will tell you, you know, what the likelihood of your instances being preempted is. Um, and this pricing history will show you kind of what everything looks like. So let's look at P2X large. Uh, and we'll say duration one month or duration three months. So you can see that prior to reInvent, which is when we launched those spot market changes, the, the price would really vary quite often. Uh, it would be very spiky. Whereas now we're able to kind of give you much more predictable results for all of these. Um, and this could also be an artifact of people just moving to the uh, P3s. Um, so it's a lot easier to kind of do this prediction now than it used to be. There are still spikes though. Um, and you can see it's different for different availability zones. One thing I am curious about is these i3 in, no, we don't have those on the spot market. Yeah, it's really cool to see, you know, what the prices were before reInvent versus what the prices are after reInvent because almost everything is, is still cheaper. No, that's not to say that it'll always be that way because obviously things on this kind of market tend to fluctuate. See, all these spikes are gone. I didn't even realize this. Somebody needs to like write about how all these spikes are gone now. Way cool. So your, your likelihood of having your instance preempted is just like so low now. And it never crosses the on-demand price. Interesting. Very interesting. Cool. Sorry. That was my first time um, playing with uh, that in a while. So cool. So this is what the data looks like, and we're trying to predict it. So we're going to create um, data set is not defined. Oh, I need to rerun some of this. Sorry. Uh, so we'll do that. This will take a hot second. Pop the data set. Everything looks good. Let's get learn. Run this again. Run this again, run this again. Um, and this is just creating the iterators. So if you remember, we, we did this all before in a previous episode where we just created these um, MXNet iterators. Pardon me, my voice is getting a little parched there. Uh, and DevOps Kuhn asks, is CUDA included? Yes, totally, totally. Um, and then Frey McGee says that the raw code of Jupyter files is hard to read. The interesting thing about that, if you're looking on mobile, yeah, it doesn't render on mobile. But if you go on your computer, GitHub has this thing that will auto render um, most of these notebooks. So you can really see them in, in kind of full glory here. And they run a bunch of, this is another machine learning demo that we did where we tried to predict whether or not um, a picture was me or not. Um, which is scary. 
Cool. So then we'll, we are just creating these iterators here on the, uh, on the data set that we have. And you can see we're creating a training data set and a uh, testing data set. Um, so train X and train Y, test X and test Y. We create our training iterator, our validation iterator. So yeah, maybe this one should be a test iterator so that we keep consistent naming. Imagine what our world would be like if we had and you can actually see what this looks like. So you can plot the whole network. And you can see this is what's being created. So you start with your data, transpose, you split, uh, fully connected layer, do other things, and you have like weird different activation functions. Um, everybody uses sigmoid, and nobody, nobody, sorry, uh, nobody really uses sigmoid anymore, do they? I think everybody uses like ReLU now. Um, rectified linear units. Um, you have this kind of LSTM thing. Then you have another fully connected layer. And then you do more stuff, and you do more stuff, more stuff. It's a very complicated network. Another fully connected layer. And finally, you come back down to what you are predicting. Um, and then you softmax to kind of get it into shape. Um, and Simon Alexin says, hello there, hello. Cool, so then we wanna train this. Uh, and I don't think this is gonna take very long at all to train, this should really just be super fast. Um, yeah, it was super fast. So we can see, we can plot it, and then we can kind of plot what we think our predictions will be. And you can see our predictions are pretty uh, close. Not bad, not bad. What would be really cool is we could take the same network, the same kind of stuff, and apply it to our tweet data. So what we did earlier is we had these tweets. Um, and what I did is I just sort of downloaded all this data. I was, you know, export data, download, create these CSVs. Uh, and then I put them all in an S3 bucket. Uh, and I don't remember what S3 bucket I put them in. Uh, so bear with me for a moment while I find that bucket. Where could it be? We're in the wrong region. I have a lot of different buckets, I'm sorry. Uh, Twitter, yeah. So it's one of these, I think it's this one. Yeah, so I have everything here. Um, so what we can do is we can just sort of hop over here. I'm just gonna delete all of this and start from scratch. Um, so let's just do kernel restart and clear output. Okay. Um, so this is not gonna be the right data frame. Uh, and Crumbling Crud asks how much longer I will be streaming for. Um, it depends on how well this thing that I'm attempting, I've never coded it before, I've never attempted it before, so if it works, I'll be coding for a while. If it doesn't work, I'm probably gonna give up and go get some lunch. Uh, but hopefully it'll work. So what we wanna do is we want to download all of these files. So um, we're going to do import boto3, uh, s3 equals boto3.client, s3. Um, then we're going to do, here, I'll block all of this out too. Why don't I just move this into a different cell? Um, and then we don't need this yet. And honestly, we don't need any of this yet because we're just trying to download and uh, well, we need pandas, and I'm gonna do reload. Don't reload. Overwrite. I have this open somewhere else, I think. So let me close this one. Um, so what I want to do is I kind of want to just do s3 dot for you know s3 dot list operation. S3 dot list 
objects, and then I think it's probably going to be bucket equals rand hunt Twitter, uh, and then we'll say for object and oh, object is a reserved word for CSV and da da da. We will do. Um, so there's also S3R, which is like a S3 resource client, which is probably what we should use um, because that might make working with this a little bit easier. So we'll say S3, oops, S3R.bucket is going to be Rand Hunt Twitter. Um, let me just insert a few working cells here to play around with. And S3R, um, sorry, bucket equals. So bucket dot download, maybe dot objects um, for object and for, let's say, for object and bucket objects, object dot download file. I think that'll work. It's not iteratable. Um, bucket dot objects. Dot. I think I need to do that in Object download file. Oh, it's the object summary. Uh, so let's see what that object looks like. Dot, and what methods do we have? Um, and then if we go like this and we say download file. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I wanted that download file thing. So if I do object dot object dot uh, download file, that shindig ought to work. No. Oh, it's because it needs to be like this. This is probably not the most efficient way of doing this. Um, and then we have to do um, object dot um, Object download file. What does this say? Download file. Isn't there just like a really fast way so I don't have to give it a file name? How about we just call it um, uh, What's in the object summary again? The key. So we'll say download file uh, key name, sorry, download file object key oh, it's gotta be dot key. Boom, that'll do it. So now I have, if I just go, and oops, sorry. How do I undo that? I didn't mean to do that. Oh well. Uh, how do I turn off line numbers here? Toggle line numbers, there we go. Uh, and then if I go ls, I should have all this stuff. Um, and then I'm just gonna say import glob. Uh, and now I can import pandas. And I'll say pandas.readcsv uh, glob. Or we'll say pandas.concat um, pandas.readcsv um, glob. Dot, oh, no, no, no. F for F and glob. Dot glob um, star CSV uh, and then DF equals. Let me just delete these. That should do it. Uh, and then we can kind of say like length of DF. 
That's not right, is it? I must have other non-tweet data in there. Uh, oh, oh, I do have other non-tweet data. So let me just say tweet. There we go, 2000. Oh, and I need to drop some duplicates too. Um, how do I do that? I think I can just do drop duplicates. Cool, so dropping all that duplicate data, we have 2,365 tweets. That's not really enough to do a good prediction, but it'll be fine. Um, and then we can kind of see what the data looks like. Um, oh, we should probably get rid of some of these columns, right? Because uh, the only one we're really interested in is, uh, um, we're really only interested in time and impressions. Uh, how did, does anybody remember in pandas how I only select a certain number of columns? Um, here. Uh, df.columns. When in doubt, insert a new cell. Um, df.calls. Df. Columns. So typically, if I go like this, it gives me just that column. And then if I go like this, it gives me just that other column. Impression? Am I spelling impression wrong? df.column. I think I'm spelling impressions wrong. Oh, um, Delinium knows what's up. I need to, I need to have two different, I need to have the columns I'm selecting in an array. Okay, that's exactly right. I don't know why I didn't remember that. df equals df um, time and impressions. And then we go df.head. Thank you so much, Delinium, for actually being able to read documentation, unlike me. Uh, okay, cool. So now we need to make some ticks. Uh, and this will just be, uh, I think, every minute. Um, oh, and there's some questions. So let me, let me go through some of the questions here. Um, Let's see. Will you save this broadcast as a clip later? Martin asks, uh, absolutely, yes, I will. Um, we'll have everything there. So let's see. We can import this date util parser. Values is gonna be df.values, reverse it. Ticks is gonna be a map over all of that. Should give us a data set sheep. Um, and then this is all my tweets, so some of my tweets get 70,000 impressions and uh, some of them get zero impressions. So as you can tell, I'm very, very popular. I'm very concerned about my, my Twitter. Uh, oh, and I need to import NumPy and everything now. So now here we can, we can actually kind of condense all of this, pull it into one little notebook here. Um, now inline that. Um, we don't need this anymore. Uh, we can import glob up here. Move this here. Move this shindig over here. Boom. And of course, everything falls apart. File name must be a string. Object dot key. Uh, and then df dot head. Everything is still the same. Cool. Uh, and then we go and we try again with this. Just want to make sure everything is still the way that I thought it was. Uh, and then we'll create our data X and our data Y. And then, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about the green screen today. One of the lights in my home office went out and I need a ladder to be able to go and fix it. So 
uh, you know, not much I can do there. I'll, I'll see if I can fix it over the weekend. Um, so we've got our data X and our data Y, and then we're gonna split these. So we're gonna take one portion of it and make it the, the training data and one portion of it and make it the test data, or as uh, Sunil has called it, the validation data. Um, and then this is the part that I don't think works anymore, this MX sim var thing. I think this we have to rename this to like variable or something. Maybe it'll work. That would be cool. Oh, sweet. It did work. That's awesome. So I mean, I can kind of walk through what the network is doing here. We're creating these LSTM cells uh, with five hidden layers and a prefix of LSTM1. We've got an LSTM2, which is another layer, which are num hidden of 10. And then we kind of unroll the input. Um, we create another one where we unroll that as well. So that's for the, the these two networks here, or these two uh, layers, well, more than single layer, but. Uh, and then we create a fully connected layer after we reshape everything and get it to the layer we want. And then we basically say where in our series of values does this fit? And, you know, show me what it looks like. And this is it really just the same network we used earlier. And we might need to change some of this around. We might need to use different kind of um, sections here for this network. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this probably won't work at all, but let's see what happens. So we're going to chain for two epochs and we're going to plot it. And <laughs> we are all over the place. So this did not work at all. It's entirely my fault. Um, our prediction data is very flat. <laughs> so I've probably got some problems where the data is supposed to be exactly. Uh, I probably need to figure out a better tick. I need to make it like go down to the minute. I, if Sunil is watching, he might have some advice for us for how to get this working. Um, but let's see. I wonder if I train for, you know, like 20 epochs if it would go better. No, no, it's not getting any better. Uh, the other thing is we might not have enough data. Yeah, this is just, I think my tick data is off. So I need to figure out how to make the ticks you go per minute, um, or even per second, if it actually goes down to that. Um, so ticks is going to be map of date util parser parse values. Uh, so what does this return exactly? Let's insert a cell here and see if we can't figure it out. Insert cell below. Um, ticks equals map date util. I'm oh, sorry, no. Uh, date util dot parser dot parse um, df dot values negative one uh, and let's go zero. Invalid syntax. Oh, that would help, wouldn't it? Uh, parser must be a stream, not an ND array, so I need to do another zero here. Um, so maybe I need to do, maybe I need to go down past, this is only going to like the minute. Huh. Well, I'm not going to sit here and waste everybody's time playing with this data set that I've never played with before. Uh, I'm going to ping Sunil later. Um, all of his stuff, again, is right here on um, uh, on GitHub. I really suggest checking it out. He's a genius with this stuff, um, and also in general. So I'm going to paste the link now. Uh, the one that we're using today is this time series modeling one. Uh, I'll show you the end result that we're trying to build over the next week or so. Um, so there's this Twitter bot that I built called WearML. Um, how do I wear ML? Uh, and this uses SageMaker. So this is using this um, 
Da, 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 da. This is using this endpoint, the predict endpoint. Uh, and I've just defined kind of a custom algorithm that I'm loading. And all I'm doing is I'm, is I'm letting people uh, send me a picture and it's trying to predict where exactly that picture was taken. Uh, so you can, you can point at this now and it's using SageMaker in production. Um, and it suggests you're in Concord, New South Wales. I think that's pretty accurate. Um, Paul Maddox did that one. Uh, maybe this is in China, maybe not. I don't know. This is, that looks like Tokyo. So yeah, you can see it's it's just kind of trying to predict using only the pictures in the image where this is from. Now, the code for all of this is gonna be um, here eventually, but it's a private repo right now. I'm not gonna make it public until we're done actually building it because my plan is actually to have you guys do a lot of the work uh, along with me. Um, so I actually just copied most of this model from the Berkeley Multimedia Commons data set. So uh, this tutorial here, you guys can just download the model. You don't even have to train it yourself. Um, but it comes from the Berkeley Multimedia Commons data set. Berkeley Multimedia which is here. Um, and it, I think it has like 100 million images or something that are, uh, many of them are tagged with geolocation data. Some are not, so uh, video, images, all kinds of stuff. And you can actually use this to build out this, uh, this model that they're talking about here. And they published a paper about it um, really, really cool, good results. And it's just sort of magical to see stuff like that happen. Uh, I'll briefly talk about one of the other components here. If we go back to SageMaker, um, we can go to the sample notebooks and we can go the introduction to Amazon algorithms. And if we look at this um, XGBoost MNIST one, I just want to make sure this is what I think it is. No, not that one. One, one different one. Sorry. That's no, not this. It's in the SageMaker Python SDK. Um, okay, cool. So this is the MNIST data set. This is a super, super common thing that people build. And I want to look at this mnist.py file. And you can see this file is just the training stuff. So what you can do here is you can define this method of, of def train that conforms to this interface. It takes the input directory, it takes the hyperparameters, um, the hosts, the number of CPUs, the number of GPUs, and various other keyword arguments that you can pull down. Um, and this is, you know, this is the whole very simple uh, 100 28 nodes um, to 64 to 10 to identify the digits. Uh, really, really simple network to identify handwritten digits. And the, the crazy thing is, using just that, all you have to do is pass in this file as the entry point. And if you go from SageMaker import MXNet or from from SageMaker dot TensorFlow, import TensorFlow, whatever, you define your entry point and it conforms to that train interface that you that I just showed you, and it will automatically create a Docker container, build out everything, go and run it, and then this MNIST estimator that you have here, you can actually go and say, you know, you call fit on it with your training data location and all that. Uh, but you can also just go ahead and create a predictor from it too. And you can call out, da da da. -da and be able to, to see it all working. So that's two different ways of training things. You can, you can um, use the Amazon algorithms, you can bring your own algorithm, and you really just have to conform to this pretty basic um, interface. 
there's a ton of stuff just in the sample notebooks worth exploring. I, I'd really spend a lot of time doing that. Um, just go through, look through each one. You'll see a bunch of different ways of invoking the SageMaker SDK, of uh, inheriting from a real-time predictor, stuff like that. And then the other thing that you can do is you can actually use um, your own Docker images. So if we go to um, this directory here, let me make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. So we go here and we go into Docker. You can see I've just created my own little Docker file um, for, and I'm actually copying the model directly in. You don't, you don't need to do this. You can actually pull the model from S3 still. You just conform to that interface. So there's like a load data thing. Um, and I'm, you can see I'm exposing this 8080 port and I have a simple flask app. And this flask app, all it does is it returns um, an MT200 request on uh, a ping, which is kind of the health check that's checking to see if, uh, if the, the, the shindig is running, if the endpoint is running. And then we have this slash invocations route. And all this is doing is getting uh, some JSON data from the request, uh, creating a result, logging it, and sending it out. And that is all you have to do to build a, a like very easily deployed SageMaker endpoint. And then you can invoke that from a Lambda function. You can invoke it from curl. So I can say, um, you know, invoke this. Oh, this is broken right now, actually, um, because I modified it. I, I messed up. Do you see where I put in max predictions here? Um, so in my predict file, this is, this is why I haven't published it yet, because it is broken. Um, where is this? Over here in predict, I am not properly passing in all of this uh, max predictions thing. Because uh, this pre-process image one is not where we want the max predictions. We want it over here. But I messed up, um, and I'll deploy that later. Um, luckily, because the, the the blank payload failed, it didn't actually get deployed in production. Um, that's it from me for now. I hope you guys have seen all of the different SageMaker stuff. One other thing I'm going to say really, really fast before we head out is that there's also a Spark connector for SageMaker. Um, this makes it really easy for working with Glue or for Amazon EMR. Here we go. So let's say you have an existing EMR job that you run pretty frequently. You can just pull this into, uh, into EMR and start being able to, to do stuff with it. Uh, and you can call right out to SageMaker. You can say, hey, build this as part of my EMR job. Uh, you can even submit it as your EMR job, basically. And you can run with Scala, you can run with PySpark, um, all kinds of good stuff there. And, and uh, Exocetus asks, is this recorded? Yes. I will say that this was more of an exploratory episode. Uh, we were just playing around with SageMaker. Next week, I will be building and shipping an actual product with SageMaker from beginning to end. Um, that where ML bot that I was showing you. Um, that's a little bit more fun and exciting, uh, in my opinion, than just going through these examples. I'll play around with the Twitter data and figure out why my ticks are not in the right place there. Um, I think it's just like I need to resize it. Uh, but I, I'm not going to waste more time now. Um, I am open to suggestions for things that you guys want to see on AWS. I've had some requests for some more Java, um, so I'm going to get to do more Java uh, a little bit later this year. Uh, it won't all be Python. But before I go, I want you guys to take a minute to kind of think about what would be useful for you to learn about. It doesn't even necessarily need to be related to AWS, and we could stream it on this channel. Uh, what kind of coding topics are you interested in seeing? What kind of uh, stuff? would help you with your day job. You know, I, I, I'm just doing these based on the things that I'm coming up with. And it'd be really helpful if the community could kind of tell me what they wanted out of these uh, 
these demos, these kind of explorations. Um, Gina says, thanks for the awesome stream. Thank you for watching. Uh, Golang, we could definitely do some Lambda in Golang. I think that would be really cool. Um, more on machine learning and deep learning, more Node.js. Uh, I'll probably avoid the Node.js, but I'll find somebody else who likes to do it. Uh, so Simon Alexen asked for Node.js. Uh, all right, Golang with serverless, we definitely can do. I'll, I'll make that um, a high priority. So I will set up for that for maybe February. So Golang. Node.js, Node.js just to make uh, Simulex and happy. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you guys so much for joining. I'm gonna go ahead and teach us how to build a Dota two bot. We could totally do that. There's actually this really cool. Yeah, I know you guys keep waiting for me to leave. To um, bot deep uh, open AI. OpenAI built this really cool Dota 2 bot. You should check it out. Uh, they played it one on one and they did self reinforcing learning. So they would uh, play against real humans and uh, almost none of them could beat it because, it, it, you know, obviously it's a robot. It's way better. Uh, okay, really leaving this time. Thank you guys so much for joining today. I have had a good time. I am super obsessed with SageMaker. There's just so much content there. I realized this was not a very concise overview of it, but please go and explore it, play around with it, see what the SDK has to offer, see what the Spark connector has to offer. Uh, and I will see you guys next week, uh, Thursday. Bye.